All right, you guys, we're on chapter 10, which is all about gases. This is the final chapter of material for Chem 103. The first thing we're gonna go over is the properties of gases. Now we've gone over these in chapter three when we talked about the physical states of matter, solids, liquids, and gases. So this should be a little bit of a review but if it's not, that's okay. That's why it's here. So I'm going to go through each of these five properties in a little bit more detail than what you see on this slide here. The first property, gases have a variable shape and volume. This means that the gas is going to take on the shape of its container. It's going to fill that container completely. If the container changes its shape, then the gas is going to change its shape as well. So it will accommodate whatever shape and volume its container is in. Property number two, gases expand uniformly. So when that gas is adjusting its shape and volume to fit its container, that gas expands uniformly. You're not gonna have pockets of concentrated gas in one corner and no gas in another, no. All of the gas particles are going to be kind of evenly distributed across the entire volume. And as that volume increases or expands, so will the gas. Gases also compress uniformly. So if the volume of the gas decreases, when the container volume decreases, you're going to have, again, uniform gas molecules all over the place, no pockets of gas. If you reduce the volume enough, the gas will liquefy. The fourth property, gases have a low density. Just to give you a little bit of reference, the density of air is 0 0.001 grams per milliliter. When we were talking about the density of different substances back in chapter two, the density of water is one gram per milliliter. So definitely a big difference between gas and liquid. What this really means is that all the particles are spaced really far apart. And the last property is that gases mix uniformly with other gases in the same container. So let's say you just had a container of air, right? Air is a mixture of gases. It's got oxygen, nitrogen, um, hydrogen, carbon dioxide, <laughs> all kinds of things in it. And all of those gases are mixed together and they are distributed evenly. So that means a mixture of gases in a sealed container will form a homogeneous mixture, which again, homogeneous mixture that's another term from chapter three. So if that doesn't make sense, if you don't remember what that is, go back to your chapter three notes or go back to the chapter three lecture where we talked about mixtures and compounds and things of that nature. Moving on to gas pressure. Gas pressure is just the result of all those gas particles moving around and striking the walls of the container. When they strike the walls of the container, they strike them with a certain amount of force, and we call that pressure. As you increase the temperature of a gas, the gas molecules start moving around a lot faster, and they strike the walls harder. That's gonna increase the pressure. We'll talk about some other variables that, uh, that affect the pressure in just a little bit, so don't worry about that too much. Just remember, for now, that the gas pressure is just the result of the molecules striking the walls of their container. When we talk about atmospheric pressure, that's the pressure of the air molecules in the environment around us. That atmosphere is pushing down on us with a constant pressure. Evangelista Torricelli invented the barometer, which measures atmospheric pressure. There are subtle changes in the atmospheric pressure due to different weather systems and weather patterns. So sunny versus cloudy versus rainy, tornadoes, hurricanes, 
there's all kinds of fluctuations that are associated with those types of weather. The way a barometer works is you have this open tank that's filled with liquid mercury. That's what this gray stuff is here. The atmospheric pressure can push down on the mercury. And mercury is very dense. When you push down on that mercury, it will travel up this glass tube. The level that the mercury reaches is the pressure of the atmosphere. Typically, you'll see millimeters of mercury as a unit of pressure. So you're literally reading the height of the mercury in the glass tube in millimeters. You'll also see other units of pressure, which we'll go over in just a minute. But I want you to know for now that two of the kind of the big units we'll be using in this class are millimeters of mercury in atmospheres. 760 millimeters of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. This table has all other types of units of gas pressure. Again, ATM or atmosphere, we're definitely going to be dealing with that. Millimeters of mercury and tor. Those are the main three that we'll be dealing with. I will give you an example of using some of the other units, but for the most part, those are the three main ones that we're going to stick to in this course. Since there are different types of units for pressure, you need to be able to convert from one to the other. So here, the barometric pressure is 26.2 inches of mercury. What's the barometric pressure in atmospheres? This is kind of like chapter two, where you have to convert from one unit to another. We have inches of mercury, and we're trying to figure out how many atmospheres. You don't need to memorize that table. I'll give you the um, unit equations so that you don't have to memorize, you know, how many millimeters of mercury are in one atmosphere or anything like that. Twenty nine point nine inches of mercury is equal to one atmosphere. That's something you can get off of the table. This is our unit equation. From that, we can write two unit factors. The unit factors look like fractions. From here, we need to decide which one of these unit factors is going to get us from inches of mercury to atmospheres. Well, we have to cancel out inches of mercury. So that means we need to use a unit factor with that on the bottom. When we do our unit analysis, you can see you get rid of inches of mercury, you're left with atmospheres, and that's what we want. After you do the math, you should get 0.876 atmospheres, which is three sig figs here. So don't forget about your sig figs. And don't forget your units. Units are very, very important. We'll do more practice with pressure conversions in class. So we covered what pressure is. We talked about atmospheric pressure specifically. Now we'll talk about the variables that can affect gas pressure. We touched on one of them, but we're gonna go a little bit deeper. We're gonna talk about the volume of the container, 
the temperature of the gas, and the number of molecules of gas in the container, and how they can all affect gas pressure. First, we'll tackle volume. When the volume of a container decreases, the gas molecules are going to collide with the container more often. That means the pressure is going to increase. I like to write this using shorthand because it makes it a little bit clearer for me. So hopefully it helps with you. So if you decrease the volume, that leads to an increase in pressure. When the volume increases, there's more space between those gas molecules. There's, so they're going to collide with the container less often because there's more space for them to roam freely, right? So that means the pressure is going to decrease. Increase the volume leads to a decrease in pressure. So this is an indirect or an inverse relationship, which means if you have one increase, the other is going to decrease and vice versa. Moving on to temperature. We touched on this when I introduced what gas pressure is. When the temperature decreases, the molecules are moving a lot slower. So that means they're going to hit the walls with less force and they're going to hit the walls less often. So the pressure is going to decrease too. To write that in shorthand, we have a decrease in temperature, which I'll abbreviate temp, leads to a decrease in pressure. If you heat up that gas, the molecules are moving faster. That means they're going to collide with the container more often and with more force. So the pressure is going to increase. Increased temperature leads to an increase in pressure. This is a direct relationship. Whatever you do to one variable, same thing happens to the other. So increase the temperature, increase the pressure. The last variable we'll talk about is molecules. So the number of molecules and pressure, how are they related? Well, we can talk about the number of molecules like the number of moles. Remember that from chapter eight? Yeah. So when the number of molecules decreases, there's fewer gas molecules colliding with the side of the container. So the pressure is going to decrease as well. We'll write this as N, which you'll see why we do this a bit later. But N is what we use with the gas laws to mean moles. When that number decreases, it leads to a decrease in pressure. But let's say you have a container that's hooked up to some kind of a gas tank, and you can add more molecules in. Well, as you increase the number of molecules, there's more molecules colliding with the side of the container. So the pressure is going to increase. Increase N leads to an increase in pressure. This is another direct relationship. So Robert Boyle used what's called a J-tube to experiment with pressure and volume. And what he found was that the volume of air decreased as he added more mercury. So you see here, he started with 60 milliliters of trapped air, and this again is the mercury. If you increase the amount of mercury, then you're going to decrease 
the amount of trapped gas. He also noticed that when he decreased the volume by half, the pressure doubled. So that leads us to Boyle's Law. Boyle's Law states that the volume of gas is inversely proportional to the pressure at constant temperature. What that looks like on a graph is you have high pressure and low volume up here, low pressure, high volume over here. The equation that we use where we can solve for different variables of pressure and volume, assuming that the temperature is constant, is P1V1 equals P2V2. P is pressure, which you probably could have guessed. V is volume. You also could have guessed that. The subscripts here, the ones, Think of those as the initial conditions of the gas. And the twos are the final conditions. This will become a little bit more clear when we do a problem. But all of the gas laws that we're going to do um, coming up are going to have kind of P1, V1, or some kind of initial conditions and some kind of final conditions. Not all of them, but most of the gas laws that we cover, we're, we're, they're gonna have something like that. So let's do an example of a Boyle's Law problem. Now you'll need to be able to read a problem and identify the type of gas law you need to solve it. You're not gonna have the convenience of a title. What I recommend you do is go through the problem and write down each number that you have and assign it a variable. I'll show you what I mean. We have a sample of methane that exerts a pressure of 1550 millimeters of mercury. What's the final pressure if the volume changes to seven liters? This first sentence tells us the initial conditions. 3.50 liters, that's a volume in its initial, so we'll call it V1. fifteen hundred fifty millimeters of mercury that's a pressure and it's an initial condition so we'll call it P1 what is the final pressure if the volume changes to seven liters well seven liters sounds like our final condition and we don't know what the final pressure is since what we're given is pressures and volumes that must mean Boyle's Law. So that's the kind of logic you're going to have to use when figuring out which gas law to use to solve a problem. Now that you know which gas law, you need to actually look at whatever equation sheet you have and find it. So you'll have all of these equations for the gas laws, but I'm not going to label them Boyle's Law or any of the other laws that we're covering. You will need to know which is which. Here we're solving for P2. That means you're going to divide both sides by V2. Gather your like terms. So all the volumes you gather together, the pressures you gather together, all on one side. Then you substitute in your numbers. The units for volume cancel, and you're left with your units for pressure. 
So when you're doing these, don't forget to include units. That you will lose points if you don't have units. If you do the math, you get 775 millimeters of mercury. If we think about it, we can kind of reason whether or not the pressure should increase or decrease based on what we know about the relationship between pressure and volume. We had an increase in volume from 3.5 liters to 7 liters. That means that we should have a decrease in our pressure because they're inversely proportional. Volume goes up, the pressure must go down. And that's what we saw here. The initial pressure was 1,550 millimeters of mercury. The final pressure is half that. The next law we'll cover is Charles's law. He discovered that the volume of a gas is directly proportional to the temperature in Kelvin. Remember, Kelvin and degrees Celsius are related with this equation. You take your degrees Celsius and add 273. You'll need to know that because all the gas laws use temperatures in Kelvin. Anywhere you see a temperature for a gas, Kelvin. If you see Celsius, convert it to Kelvin. So this is Charles's law right here. This is the equation. Not exactly usable in this form. What you need to do first is cross multiply. Now you have something that you can um, rearrange and isolate a particular variable. So let's go ahead and do a practice problem. But first, and I don't know why I always forget that this slide is here. It's like my brain blocks it out. This is just an illustration of Charles's law. So if you have a balloon and you drip some liquid nitrogen on it, you're going to rapidly decrease the temperature of the gas inside. That's going to cause the volume of the balloon to shrink. I don't recommend playing with liquid nitrogen because it can be dangerous, but it's kind of cool. So maybe watch a video. So here's the problem that I was threatening. We have a 132 liter helium balloon that is heated from 20 degrees Celsius to 40 degrees Celsius. What is the final volume if we keep the pressure constant? First step is always to assign your variables. The first sentence tells us a lot about the initial conditions and it tells us a little bit about the final conditions. So we've got an initial volume, an initial temperature, and a final temperature. the question asks us about the final volume. Notice how these temperatures are in Celsius. We can't use them until they are in Kelvin. So you have to add 273. When you do that, you have 293 Kelvin and 313 Kelvin, respectively, for T1 and T2. Now we can look at what we have. We've got volumes and temperatures. That means Charles's law. Remember that you have to cross multiply first. Then you can look at which variable you need to isolate. We're looking for V2.
Divide both sides by T1. We isolate our temperatures together and we leave that volume out on its own. Substitute in all of your numbers from the problem. When you do the math, you should get 141 liters. Let's double check that with our logic. We went from 20 degrees to 40 degrees Celsius. So that's an increase in temperature. That means we should expect an increase in volume as well. And that's what we see, 141 liters is bigger than 132 liters. Don't forget that step of checking with your logic. You can't do that with all of the gas laws, but for some of them you can. And when you can use your logic to check and make sure you put things into your calculator correctly, you should absolutely do it. The third law we'll cover is Gay-Lussac's law. He looked at pressure and temperature. It looks suspiciously like Charles's law. There's a direct relationship between pressure and temperature. Again, you have to cross multiply so that this can be useful. Let's try a problem. A steel container of nitrous oxide at 10.4 atmospheres is cooled from 33 degrees Celsius to negative 28 degrees Celsius. What is the final pressure at constant volume? As always, you have to write down all of the given information and assign what each piece of information is. 10.4 atmosphere, that looks like an initial pressure because we're told about the container of gas in the first sentence. The 33 degrees Celsius, that's the temperature initially, and the gas was cooled to negative 28 degrees Celsius, so that's T2. We don't know what the final pressure is. We have all pressures and temperatures. So that means Gay-Lussac's law. Cross multiply. Now we're ready to isolate a variable. We need to find P2. We're going to divide both sides by T1. And there you have it. That's the equation for P2. Substitute in your numbers. And don't forget, if you have degrees Celsius, you have to convert to Kelvin. So you add 273 to each of these. Now you're ready to rock and roll. I just said ready to rock and roll. I don't know what's wrong with my brain today. That's certainly not something I normally say.
when you do the math, you should get 8.33 atmosphere. But we can do a double check on this one with our logic as well. We went from 33 degrees to negative 28 degrees Celsius, which is ridiculous. That is for sure a decrease in temperature. Since there's a direct relationship between pressure and temperature, we should expect to see a decrease in pressure too. And that is in fact what we see. 8.33 atmospheres is what we calculated, which is less than the initial pressure of 10.4. We can combine all three of those gas laws to obtain the combined gas law. I know, very original name. You have to cross multiply to make this useful. And I'll show you how to solve for a couple of variables so you see what I mean. So cross multiply then you can isolate whatever variable you need. Here we're looking for V2 so we divide both sides by P2 T1. And we'll do an example of this so that it's a little bit more clear. Some people need to see the variables moved around and some people need to see the numbers. Oops, we're solving for V2, not P2. So when you rearrange things and kind of make it nice and pretty, you get that the volume is equal to V1 times P1 over P2 times T2 over T1. The trick here is, one, solving for the right variable, and two, keeping the subscript straight. So if you flip T1 and T2, you're going to get the wrong answer here. So your bookkeeping skills need to be on point. Let's try another one. cross multiply and this time we're looking for T2 now we can divide both sides by P1 V1 pull out that temperature and group together the pressures and the volumes. So that's how you can solve for a given variable using the combined gas law. Now we'll go through and do an actual problem. You have a 10 liter sample of carbon dioxide at 300 Kelvin and one atmosphere. If the volume and Kelvin temperature double, what is the new pressure? So definitely more variables here. So let's start with the specific numbers that were given in the problem. We've got an initial volume an initial temperature, and an initial pressure. If the volume and Kelvin temperature double, well, that means 20 liters for V2 and 600 Kelvin for T2, what is the new pressure? 
no idea. We need to use the combined gas law. When you see pressure, temperature, and volume, you have to use the combined gas law. Cross multiply. And we're solving for P2 this time. Oops. Divide by V2 T1. on both sides. There's our equation. Again, be careful here with your subscripts and be careful when you're putting in your numbers. Make sure V1 is really V1, V2 is really V2. You'll also want to look to make sure that your volume, so V1 and V2, that they're in the same units. You can't use liters and milliliters in the same problem. You have to convert. We'll do some problem solving in next week's class. So all these little tips and hints, you'll see them in action. So that's what we're doing for the math. And it turns out the new pressure ain't really that new. The pressure stays the same. Okay. This is one of those problems where you can't really guess. You can't really use logic with the combined gas law. You don't know which variable is going to come out on top in terms of governing the changes that you see in the pressure or the volume or the temperature. So you have to be very careful, use your calculator, and don't forget your units. Now we're going to build some concepts and talk about a couple of other gas laws. The first concept is the vapor pressure concept. If you have a liquid in a closed container, there's going to be some vapor, okay? Some of that liquid the molecules in that liquid are going to escape the surface and hang out in the air above the liquid. Vapor pressure increases as temperature increases, which makes sense. So keep the concept of vapor pressure in the back of your mind. Now we'll talk about Dalton's Law of Partial Pressures. If you've ever gone scuba diving, which I never would in my life, but maybe you have, or you at least know the concept of scuba diving, right? You need some kind of oxygen to breathe while you're underwater. Unless you're a fish, then you can just take it out of the water. But we're not fish, we're people. So we need to bring our oxygen with us. And oftentimes you'll see a mixture of gases. It's not just straight up oxygen, but you'll see a mixture of oxygen gas, nitrogen gas, and helium for your breathing tank. That's the gas that you breathe in while you're scuba diving. If we wanted to know the total pressure of the gases inside of that tank, Dalton's law says that we would just add together the individual pressures of each of the gases. So the PT or P total would be the pressure exerted by the oxygen gas plus the pressure exerted by the nitrogen gas plus the pressure exerted by the helium. You can do this for any mixture of gases. 
Here's a sample problem. It's very, very simple. We'll do some slightly more complex problems in class next week. Let's say we've got a sample of noble gases with helium, neon, argon, and krypton. If the partial pressure of helium is 125 millimeters of mercury, neon is 45, argon is 158, and krypton is 17, what is the total pressure of the sample? Well, the total pressure is going to be equal to the partial pressure, the sum of the partial pressures of all of these. The helium, the neon, the argon, and the krypton. You need to make sure that all of these are in the same unit of pressure. So if one of them was in atmospheres, you'd have to convert that to millimeters of mercury. We'll do something like that next week. And that's it. You literally just add them together for the total pressure. But we can take the concept of vapor pressure and Dalton's law of partial pressures to talk about collecting a gas over water. This is something that is done experimentally. So on the right, you see a piece of zinc metal that's in a sulfuric acid solution, which means that it's sulfuric acid dissolved in water. When you add that zinc metal, you're going to start forming hydrogen gas. It's going to bubble up through the water or through the um, sulfuric acid, and you're going to collect your hydrogen gas in the air space up here. Remember the concept of vapor pressure. If you have a liquid in a closed container, or at least partially closed, in the case of this graduated cylinder, you're going to collect vapor. There's water in the sulfuric acid, so there's more than just hydrogen gas here. There's water vapor as well. This gas sample is what's called wet gas because it's got what we're interested in, the hydrogen gas, and water vapor. We can figure out how much vapor pressure the water is contributing to the overall pressure of the gas sample by using this table. You do not need to memorize this table. I will give you any information you need on the exam to be able to complete the problem. It would be completely rude for me to tell you to memorize this table. What we have is starting at 5 degrees Celsius and ending at 100 degrees Celsius, what the pressure of water is at a given temperature in millimeters of mercury. So at 5 degrees, it's 6.5. At 100 degrees, it's 760, which is convenient because this is the boiling point of water. And at the boiling point, your vapor pressure is going to equal the atmospheric pressure. So this table will definitely help you. And again, you do not need to memorize it. Just know how to use it. If we apply Dalton's law of partial pressures, we can determine the pressure of the gas collected in the, in the, in the graduated cylinder here. Because we have the pressure from the hydrogen gas plus the pressure from the water vapor. If what we're looking for is this and we're given the total pressure and we can look up the water vapor on that um, table that means the only thing that we don't know is the pressure 
of the hydrogen gas. You can rearrange and solve and this is the equation that's going to help you find the partial pressure of hydrogen gas. So let's put some numbers to it. Numbers always help me. Let's say we're collecting a sample of hydrogen gas over 20 degrees Celsius water. The atmospheric pressure is 755 millimeters of mercury. What is the pressure exerted by the hydrogen gas in the cylinder? A couple of things. This pressure here, the atmospheric pressure, that's telling us the total pressure. The sample was collected over 20 degrees Celsius water. You have to look up on that chart what the vapor pressure is. I'll tell you, it's 17.5 millimeters of mercury. We have our total pressure is equal to the sum of the pressures of the hydrogen gas and the water vapor. If we subtract the pressure from the water vapor from the total pressure, we should get the pressure of just the hydrogen gas. You substitute in the numbers. And there you go. But wait, we just did subtraction. And in order for us to do sig figs, we have to take into account the number of decimal places each of these numbers has. So by lining up your numbers, like this, Hope this is bringing back memories of the prerequisite science skills and doing the scientific notation, doing sig figs and all of that. We can't just report this decimal number straight from the calculator. The last digit that we can hold on to is in the ones place. So we have to look to the right to see whether or not we round it up or stay the same. It's a 5, so we're going to round up. So don't forget that with partial pressures, when you're doing any kind of addition or subtraction, you care about the number of decimal places, not the number of significant figures in the measurement. Now we're going to do some more concepts and then we'll end with one final gas law. The kinetic molecular theory of gases talks about how gas molecules mu move around and interact with each other. So we know gases are made up of tiny molecules. Those molecules move around really, really quickly and they move in straight lines in random directions. When the molecules pass by each other, they don't have any kind of attraction for one another. It also means that they have no repulsion either. So they don't push each other away, they don't bring each other in, they just kind of keep going, they don't interact with each other. When the molecules collide, they just bounce off of each other. There's no loss of energy. The average kinetic energy of a gas molecule in a container of gas is proportional to the Kelvin temperature 
That's why we have to use Kelvin. So the kinetic energy, the average energy of a gas molecule is proportional to the Kelvin temperature. So that temperature tells you how much energy on average gas molecules have. You'll need to understand these in a way that you can answer multiple choice questions about them. So recognize, is this one of the, um, is this one of the pieces of the kinetic molecular theory or not, or fill in the word here, that kind of thing. Nothing too, nothing too heavy. So when we're talking about Kelvin, we have to talk about the concept of absolute zero. So when the temperature The temperature where the pressure and volume of a gas theoretically reaches zero is absolute zero. So if you were to extrapolate a graph where you're measuring the temperature and volume of a gas all the way back to when both of those things where the volume is zero, then the temperature would be negative 273 three degrees Celsius or zero Kelvin. Now we're on to our last gas law. We talked about how the pressure of a gas is inversely proportional to the volume and it's directly proportional to the number of molecules of gas and the temperature. One way to write that is like this. And this is just a little simple that means proportional to. You can introduce a constant, which we use R, so that you can equate the pressure to the number of moles of gas, the temperature, and the volume. So it's just a number that instead of just being proportional to, it's equal to. This gas constant is what we will define next. So you can rearrange the equation to get the ideal gas law, which you may have seen if you've taken chemistry before. And the R value that we'll use in this class is 0 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. It's kind of a mouthful, but you need all of those units to cancel when you're doing the math. And I'll show you what that means. How many moles of neon gas occupy 2.34 liters at STP? Remember that STP is standard temperature and pressure, where the temperature is zero degrees Celsius, and the pressure is one atmosphere. Zero degrees Celsius is the same as 273 Kelvin. So that's from chapter eight. You'll need to know those conditions for standard temperature and pressure. This is the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT. This is the only law that we have that also accounts for the number of moles of gas. So anytime you see something asking about moles and gas, you're gonna have to use the ideal gas law at some point. Let's write out what we have. So we know our volume is 2.34 liters. We have 273 Kelvin as our temperature. One atmosphere as our pressure. And that R constant is 0.0821 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. 
word to the wise when we're dealing with the ideal gas law for the purposes of our class the pressure must be in atmospheres otherwise you have to use a different R constant that has different pressure units we're not introducing that here your volume must be in liters you you will have to convert if it's in milliliters now with those two caveats let's continue we're trying to figure out how many moles moles or n so to solve for n we divide both sides by RT then we substitute in the numbers So those are all the numbers that you have to put in there. I know, it's kind of a lot. And when you do the math, you should get 0.104 moles. We'll do some more complex problems and we'll kind of combine some of these gas law ideas and concepts to make some more complex problems for our chapter 10 problem solving session. But that's it. You've got all the basics for chapter 10. And like I said, we'll solve problems and get you ready for that final exam. Don't forget that you have Mastering Chemistry for chapter 10 due Sunday, November 22nd. There's no chapter check-in. If you are in section eight, which is the Monday morning Chem 103 class. Your final exam is December 7th from 8 a.m. to 10 a.m. If you are in Section 6, which is the Tuesday afternoon class, your final exam is December 8th from 2 to 4 p.m. We'll talk about other arrangements for the potential of a kind of office hours or a final exam review or something like that in between Thanksgiving and finals week. Good luck.